or maybe all of the above. And, and maybe if you didn't personally have problems, uh, maybe you know of someone that did, or maybe you heard about problems or uh, experienced that through somebody else that was going through something. Uh, maybe we experience things that uh, frustrate us, right? Those could be problems, something that just makes us frustrated. Maybe we uh, experience problems that make us angry. Any of you ever face something like that, a problem or a situation that actually just kind of makes you angry? You see things that are happening in the world. You ever get angry at what you see going on out there? I know I do sometimes. Um, or maybe you see things or experience things that actually just break your heart, that make you sad and just really crush you and break your heart that way. I, I, know, that, uh, I know that I do oftentimes. And uh, what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit today about how to handle problems that we experience in a way that actually honors God and gives God glory. This is an interesting subject to me um, because for a few different reasons. One is I think that um, the church has not always done a fantastic job with this, with dealing with problems that, that come at them. Uh, I think we get some kind of strange, weird ideas sometimes as followers of Jesus when problems come to us or, or around us or to the world that we care about or to people that we care about. Uh, how are we supposed to deal with them? I know sometimes we can get maybe the idea that uh, as followers of Christ, the best way to ha handle a problem is just pretend it doesn't exist, right? Because after all, aren't we supposed to walk by faith and not by sight? So if we just, if we just kind of pretend there is no problem, then everything will be good. And so we show up on Sunday and how you doing? Oh, man, I'm blessed. It's going good. How was your week? Oh, it was good. It was fine. Yeah, really? Really, how was your week? Because the look on your face tells me maybe it wasn't a great week. But, uh, but don't we sometimes feel this pressure or this idea or we get this idea that as followers of Jesus, that's the best way to handle a problem. Just pretend there isn't one. Just, uh, just act like everything's just okay. And I think that's weird, and I don't think that's the best way to handle a problem. Uh, another thing that we do sometimes as followers of Christ, as believers, is maybe we get the idea that the best way to handle a problem is to get really angry about it, right? Like if we get really mad and we get really angry and we, we tell the world how mad we are at them and how angry we are at this problem and this situation and let's, uh, you know, let's uh, um, uh, uh, organize a protest and we'll protest the problem and we'll, we'll be as angry as we can and if we do that, the world will see how angry we are and that will solve the problem. And certainly the church has been guilty of doing some of that, haven't they? And it hasn't worked out so well for them, really historically. If you look at some of the ways the church has tried to solve problems, uh, it is a sad, sad tale if you look back at it. Um, another strange thing I think we do with problems is get the idea maybe that we're just supposed to put it all in God's hands. And don't get me wrong, there's a time to put things in God's hands and to let go of things. Uh, but I think that, again, that's strange to just say, well, it's in God's hands. You know, a, a friend comes to you and they've got a situation, something they're going through, and you say, well, we'll just, just put it in God's hands. It'll be okay. The Bible has some things to say about people to do that. If your brother comes to you in need and you say, and you actually have it within your ability to help them, and you say, well, go and be warm and peace be with you, kind of like it, God's going to work it all out. It'll be okay. Maybe you even say this, I'll pray for you. And, uh, and then you don't really do anything to solve the problem. I think that's weird. I think that's strange, and I don't think that's uh, helpful or beneficial. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how do we do this? How do we solve problems? I actually think that one of the greatest responsibilities of a person who's following Jesus is to actually be a problem solver. I don't know that really there's any greater responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus than to solve problems. And you might say, well, you know, I'm not so sure about that. Well, think about what's the greatest problem that exists on planet Earth. And that is that people need the saving knowledge of Jesus. They need a Savior. And wouldn't we all agree as followers of Jesus that it's our responsibility to share the love of God and the gospel with others so that they come to the saving knowledge of Christ? That's, that's the greatest solving, problem solving any of us could ever do. That's, there is no higher level of solving a problem than that one right there. 
Um, I think that uh, we see this in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Very familiar scripture. And uh, the 13th verse. Matthew 5, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are, notice, the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. I believe this is representative of, of us Solving problems, we're the, we're the light of the world. We're the problem solvers of the world. We're a city set on a hill that should not be hid. In Isaiah 60, we, we talk a lot about this scripture because uh, for a few different reasons, it is a prophetic word regarding the future of the New Testament church. And I personally believe that it is the season that the church is entering into right now where it says, arise and shine for your light has come. That arise and shine, we taught a series on this, literally means stand up and become light. Stand up and become light. Uh, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Stand up and become light. How, what does that mean to stand up and become light? It means, I believe, in part at least, to stand up and solve problems. Stand up and, and be a problem solver. Do it, but do it God's way. Uh, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good. Uh, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. In other words, Jesus went about solving problems, didn't he? Come on, somebody. Everywhere Jesus went, he solved a problem. If you were demon-possessed, he dealt with it. If you were sick, he dealt with it. If you needed correction, he dealt with it. If you needed truth, he dealt with it. If you needed love and forgiveness and mercy and grace, he dealt with it. He, he encountered problems, but when he encountered them, he actually solved them. He went about doing good, and aren't we to follow him? <laughs> Amen? So then the question is, how do we do it? How do we solve problems? You can say it this way. How do we solve problems Jesus' way? How do we solve problems in a way that isn't weird, that isn't strange, that, 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 that isn't harsh, but is actually effective? I, I think that as we, we see in Isaiah that it says that darkness will fill Earth, the earth and great darkness, the people of the earth. And I think clearly we can see that darkness is, is covering the earth. And the idea is that as the world gets darker, we're supposed to get brighter. And I think that much of that looks like having the answers to the problems that the world has. I truly believe this with all of my heart. We have access to God. We have access to the answers that the world needs. So how do we do this? I'm going to give you four simple steps. It's all pretty simple stuff, but there's a couple of really important statements in this that I hope you get this morning. How to solve problems. Number one, pray. Before you ever consider trying to solve a problem, talk to God about the problem first. Pray first. I think sometimes we, when we uh, experience situations in our life and troubles and things like that, we can be so quick, can't we, to just react, right? And, and that's the temptation always. When, when something happens, let's react and let's react quickly to it because the quicker we react, the quicker we can resolve the situation. And don't we find so many times that that's not always the case? We need to remember the power of the pause, that if we'll just, if we'll just pray, and if we'll just talk to God about it, James uh, chapter 1 and verse 5 says that if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you in abundance. And so when you see situations that, that need to be addressed, 
before you do anything, before you inject yourself into that situation at all. Maybe it's a maybe it's a communication problem. Maybe it's a problem at work that you're having communicating with one of your employees. Maybe it's a relational sh- with your with one of your children or with your spouse. Uh, maybe it's a financial problem. Whatever that. Maybe it's a health issue that you're having and you're struggling with 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 physical health in your body. Go to God and ask Him. I've done this so many times where I've been struggling with something with with some type of an ailment, if you will, in my body. And I've gone to God and I've said, God, I need wisdom. What is going on here? And you not just immediately, you know, said, hey, Neva, can you pray and lay hands on me? Because I need to be healed. Well, maybe, but maybe I need to talk to God about it. And maybe when I do and I ask him for wisdom, he gives me wisdom and he says, hey, if you change your diet a little bit, it'll really help you feel better. It'll deal with some of this stuff, right? We can get wisdom to solve problems. Maybe in my relationship with, with, with my spouse and I can just be beating my head against the wall trying to figure out how do I make this relationship better? How do I solve this problem? And if I can just, instead of just constantly trying to engage in it, if I can just pull back, remember the power of the pause, talk to God, communicate, pray, ask him for wisdom. I can be confident that he will give me the wisdom I need to solve the problem at hand. Proverbs 3, 6 says that if we acknowledge him in all of our ways, he'll direct our path. Man, acknowledge him with these situations that are coming in your life, these problems that are coming. And wait on him, wait for direction. I like to say it this way, if you don't know, don't go. You know, if you don't know, don't go. Just, just wait and wait on him and seek, seek wisdom and seek direction for how to solve those situations. But remember this, as, as, as we're praying and we're seeking to do it fervently, expecting to get answers, James uh, 5, 16 says, Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. But notice this part, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or makes tremendous power available. Uh, You could read this this way. The heartfelt prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. So when we're praying regarding problems and situations, thank you, sometimes... Sometimes as Christians, we do another, we do a lot of weird things. Did you know that? We really do. Sometimes as Christians, we, we, we'll, we'll use prayer as a cop-out from actually doing anything real to solve the problem. Um, don't raise your hand, but have you ever had somebody come to you with a situation and you would say, said to that person, I'll, I'll pray for you. And then you actually never even really prayed for them because you got busy or distracted. I have. I've actually done that. Oh, I'll be praying for you, you know. And then I get busy and I get distracted, and it's like I never even actually prayed for them. Or if I do pray for them, it's kind of like some quick, you know, well, God be with them and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I've done my part. I've, I've, I've done all I can do to solve the problem. But if we are going to pray first, let's make we're sure we're praying this way. Fervent, heartfelt prayers of a righteous man make tremendous power available. The old time Pentecostals used to call it praying through. Remember that praying through. And man, they would pray and they would pray and they would pray and they would get on their knees. And if they had to stay up all night and pray, they would pray and they would fast and pray and they would pray through. They would pray to get the breakthrough. Don't use prayer as a cop-out to solving, actually solving the problem. Thank you. Use prayer as a foundation to solve the problem. Prayer is where you start. It's where you lay that foundation. But it's not the excuse to lay it off on somebody else or to say problem solved or I've done my part or I've done all I can do about it. You have that prayer be that foundation that you build your problem-solving skills on. Amen? Number one, pray. Number two, look in the mirror often. Look in the mirror often. People who are expert problem solvers understand the importance of examining their own hearts before they try to meddle in other people's hearts. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5 says it very well. Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. For with judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. 
And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I love this because it, it doesn't actually say that we're not supposed to meddle in other people's problems. It doesn't say we're not supposed to help people remove the speck from their own eyes. It just says before we do that, we're supposed to do something else first, and that is look in the mirror and remove the log from our own eye. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes when I've been faced with a problem, with a situation, and I've been looking at the individual that is causing the problem, and I've been trying to fix the individual that's causing the problem, if I stop long enough to look in the mirror, I'm like, oh, no, I'm actually the problem. Have you ever done that? Like, like, oh, wow, I'm actually the problem. It's actually not them. It's actually me. I'm the problem, and I need to remove the log in my own eye before I try to help that person with, with their problem. So much damage has been done to the cause of Christ by ignoring this rule. I, b- I believe this is the number one thing that has caused the church from that has kept the church from being effective at solving problems because we've forgotten this one rule. And by forgetting this one rule, we have elevated our preferences above the problem. We have made preferences the problem instead of actually addressing real problems and real things that need to be dealt with. We've elevated our preferences and we focused on those. Should we have drums on, in church on Sunday? Let's make that a problem. Is it okay for somebody on stage to have tattoos? Let's make that a problem and let's focus on that. It's a preference. And these days, you know, and and, and, and it just confuses the world. What happens when we elevate our preference over the problem is we lose credibility. We lose all credibility and the world stops looking to us or listening to us to solve their problems. Listen, believe it or not, the world actually wants us to solve their problems. They want answers. They want answers. But when, but when we make it about our preference instead of about the truth, it just, it just muddies the water. It confuses everybody. We go to one church, and they say, you, you know, if you've got a tattoo, you can't be on, church, on, on worship team. You go to another church, and they say you've got to have three tattoos to even qualify for, for, to be on the worship team, right? You've got to be the hipster, you know. You've got to have the look. And, 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 and it just creates all of this confusion. And we do this so often where we elevate our preference And we make it about that. And then number three, determine if you're the right man or the woman for the job. Uh, This may come to a shock to some of us, but every problem is actually not yours to solve. But some are. And again, there's ditches on both sides of the road with this where, where we get, you know, hey, it's none of my business and it's not, you know, it's not, I'm not qualified or, or how can I help anyway? Or we go to the other side of the ditch where we think every single problem that exists we're supposed to inject ourselves and be part of. I love what Romans 12.3 says. It says, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. What I like to do when something is bothering me or or breaking my heart or frustrating me or annoying me or keeping me up at night, I like to go through a couple of things to check to see if I should be involved with it or not. One, I, I want to determine, is this cause, is it something that is big in my heart? Or am I just listening to the chatter? Because I can listen to a problem out there in the world long enough, and all of a sudden I, it can begin to bug me too because it's bugging everybody else, or it's bugging people that are part of my political party. So uh, if it's bugging them, it probably should bug me too or, or whatever. But if I just take a moment and I say, is, is this really something that matters to my heart? Is it a cause that 
that matters to me? Is it something that I think I should be involved with? I love what King David did when he was just a shepherd boy, remember, and he went out to the battlefield to bring his brother's lunch, and he saw something that others didn't see. He saw a cause. And when he saw Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And something rose up in him. He saw a problem, but not only did he saw a problem, he saw a cause, and he believed that he had it within himself to solve the problem. Come on, somebody. He didn't, just, he didn't just see a problem. He saw a problem with a cause and believed that he had what it took to solve the problem. And so he went out, and of course, he solved that problem. The second thing I like to do is, is if it is a cause and something that really matters to me and really is important to me, then I want to ask myself, do I have the actual ability to do something about it? Like, like, am I committed? Do I know enough about this topic? Because there's a whole lot of things that I have opinions about, but, but, but I do not have the, the skill set or the knowledge or the understanding to share my opinions in an authoritative way. I've got opinions. They're just uneducated opinions, right? We all have lots of those, don't we? And an uneducated opinion is not going to solve a problem, right? So if it, really, if it really does matter to me, and it really is something that I believe I'm supposed to be involved with, am I willing to commit the necessary time to actually solve the problem? Am I committed to it? If I don't have the skills that I need and the knowledge that I need, am I willing to uh, spend the time to learn those things? What, what do I need to solve this problem? What's it going to take? God gives you wisdom. and You think you have an idea of how you can fix something. Am I willing to commit to it? This is the difference between being a critical thinker and a critical person. A critical person sees all the problems and talks about all the problems. The world does not need more critical people. The world does not need more people talking about all the problems out there. The world needs problem solvers. And a critical thinker quietly solves the problem, while a critical person does nothing but talk about the problem and bring attention to the problem. But they don't have solutions. So maybe if we don't have solutions, maybe we should just zip it. Are there lots of problems out there? You bet there are. Can we talk about them all day, every day? Sure we can. But maybe, maybe rather than just talking about the problem, maybe we should get quiet and pray, ask God for wisdom, determine whether or not it's in our wheelhouse or not. And if it's not, maybe we should stay quiet. And if it is, then maybe we should just actually put some boots on the ground and get to work and fix some things and make some things better. I think we'd have a lot more credibility if we did more doing and less talking. I think people would be a whole lot more interested in our message if they saw us doing more and talking less, says the preacher <laughs> who talks for a living. <laughs> hmm. Critical people tell everyone what's wrong. Critical thinkers quietly solve problems. Let's be critical thinkers. Let's see the problem. Let's get solutions. Let's solve those problems. I believe it's, I believe it's the call of God on our life. Uh, I actually believe that it's, uh, it's the, the next, if not the last, great revival that's going to spread through planet Earth. You guys have heard me say this many times. I think it, we see it in Isaiah 60 where it goes on after talking about darkness filling the earth, but you're supposed to stand up and become light. And then it actually goes on to say that, that kings will come to you and nations will come to you. What are they coming to you for? For the light. What is the light? It's, 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 it's the solution. They're coming to you for solutions, not for criticism. Not to tell everybody what's wrong, but for solutions, for answers. 
And then the fourth and final one, and we'll let you go after this today, is to, is to stay thankful. If we're going to actively engage in this activity of, of making things better, uh, it's so critical, so important that we, that we stay thankful. Um, because we know that the minute we begin to be unthankful, we are on a very short path to making poor decisions, right? The, the quickest path to making a wrong decision is to be unthankful. And so when we're, particularly when we're being intentional about engaging in this problem-solving activity, it, by nature, we're going to be more aware, we're going to see these things, right? And we're going to say, okay, let's, let's get in there and fix it. Well, man, while we're doing it, it's so important that we continue to give thanks. I, I love the Apostle Paul who he just had such a handle on the power of thanksgiving. And one of the things that just fascinates me is in um, almost all of his church letters, he opens up with, every time I think about you, I give thanks for you. Every time I think about you, I give thanks for you. Now, listen, these people that Paul said that about were causing him tremendous problems, right? I mean, you talk about somebody who had to deal with problems. The Apostle Paul had to deal with a lot of problems, and most of those problems were caused by people. <laughs> right? The very people that he was pastoring, that he was shepherding. But he said, it, particularly the church at Corinth, because, man, that church did some goofy things. I mean, they did some things that were just like, like I don't even want to talk about some of the stuff they did in mixed company, right? I mean, they did some messed up stuff. But yet Paul said, every time I think about you, I give thanks to God for you. And I think Paul knew that if he didn't stay thankful, he would get bitter and angry and lose his capacity to solve problems. Because hmm? it, it can get really easy to just get frustrated and bitter and just fed up with it all. And just, you know what, I'm just fed up. I'm just, I'm just tired of it all. I'm tired of all the problems. The world's just, you know, it's just going down the drain. I'm just tired of it. And I'm just going to ignore it all. But we, so we must stay thankful as we're addressing these things and as we're leaning into being these kinds of people that I believe God has called us to be. As I said, I don't think there's any greater call on our life than to be these people that are out there seeing things that need to be solved, seeing problems that need to be solved and being actively engaged with doing it. With that, let me pray, and then we'll let you go today. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your word. Lord, grace us and help us to do these things. Help us to walk in these truths and live these things out in our life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed that message by Pastor Jerry Alston. If you would like to partner with us or for more information, visit our website at therefuge.online.